Hello. How are you all? Let me know if you can hear me, if everything's good. Oh my gosh, I hate seeing myself with a weird delay coming back at me. It's the weirdest thing. It shouldn't affect you, but it affects me. Uh, but welcome to Real Magic Review. My name is Steve Faulkner. I'm your host. <laughs> I'm your host for the evening. God, I haven't said that for a long time. I mean, God, imagine having an audience. That'd be good, wouldn't it? And all, I mean, a live one. I mean, you're an audience and, and, and just as relevant, of course. Um, so... Listen, let me know you can hear me okay. Let me know all is good. There's some weird stuff going on this week, technically. It, it's been fine today, but there's been some really odd stuff. So thanks, Leonard. Hey, Ace. How you doing? Hey, Leonard. How are you doing? The Tiny Moo just bought the Royal Road for myself. It's always been on my list of things to get. It's just been pushed back by the flashy new titles I've been hearing about. Oh, man. Tell me about it. Um, great. Uh, hey, Magic Adam. How you doing? Good. So this is a big subject I want to talk about today. But before I do, of course, uh, please like and subscribe. And man, it's so important. Uh, but I'm not going to bang on about it. It's awful, isn't it? I don't want to kind of just keep going on about it. But it's so when I mean, people go, shall I? And it just, you know, makes all the difference for stuff to review to being people seeing you. This is a niche channel. It's never going to be up there in the millions. And that's fine. That's not why I do it, uh, which I suppose we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but it just it just kind of lets feedback and it's know you're there. And, it, and it's really lovely to, uh, to see you there. Uh, Kabaled, long time no see. How you doing? I don't know if I've said that right. P feel free to uh, correct me. So there are various layers. Oh, did I say card magic course? No, I didn't. Blimey. God, that's the, that's the big one. Go and check out cardmagiccourse.com. Cardmagiccourse.com is my, they're all courses. Within each of those courses, you get loads of videos. Uh, so sign up for Cardmagiccourse.com, live sessions every week, a wonderful community, a very safe, lovely community with no ego whatsoever, which is the theme of this thing. And, um, and it's just something I'm incredibly proud of. So check out Cardmagiccourse.com. If you like this sort of stuff, you will love that course. And there's no commitment. You just join up, cancel whenever you want. And of course, all the stuff is downloadable. Brilliant. So... Ego. First of all, in this context, I want to kind of um, define ego because it, it's something that I thought about such a lot and, and it's not quite as obvious as we think it is. Because when we talk about ego, we talk, we think, we talk about people that are egotistical. We think about people that, you know, they've got that personality where it's just all about them and it's just me. And it's kind of almost like a pathological uh, ego that, that some people have got and actually there's not that many people I meet like that it's quite a rare thing when you meet someone you just go blind I mean there are a couple of people I can think of I'm just going really you've got a very high opinion of yourself <laughs> and it's not about self-esteem it's not about kind of a healthy kind of good opinion of yourself we, we want to love ourselves it's really important you know but but in a way that is is all is way over the top where they can see no flaws in themselves and that's a different thing and that's something I think is is something we tend to grow out of but uh, but there is there is a kind of s less explicit and a, s a more subconscious thing that i think if we don't actually consciously think about it and go actually is this you know but let's brutally honest with myself and i think part of it is sharing is a good way to be honest and and kind of i'm picking it and this is still what i'm doing i haven't nailed this really but i titled this uh, about this video um, about when let get, letting go of ego and that changing my life and and it's something I'm still trying to do but and by, let's go back to to kind of when I was younger and I, I know it's a bit me 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 so I'm kind of banging on about yourself and going around about ego but I, I hopefully everything I say is in service of what I'm trying to say and, and kind of um, helping other people and, and kind of defining and understanding what may be limiting us. That's the point. So when I was a kid, I lived in a small town and I was a, it's a long story, but I was a very good break dancer. And, uh, and I was told I was talented a lot. And then I got in and then a long story short, I just got this mindset of anything I could do. If I worked really, really hard, at it, I could do it. So I did a few things. I played the guitar and uh, skateboarding and all that. And I was pretty good at that sort of stuff. But I don't forget I lived in a small town. So it's kind of easy to be a big smish. Big smish? A very, very large smish in a small town, uh, Mr. Bond. Uh, <laughs> a uh, big fish in a small pond, in, even. Um, and, 
so I was kind of, and people, oh, you're so tired. Everything you do, you can do really well. They didn't see all the stuff I could do, but I was awful at loads of stuff. But they didn't see it because I didn't let them see it. And that was where the ego started creeping in. And there's lots of research on this. There's a great book, uh, Mindset, Carol Dweck's work on, on all this kind of stuff. But basically, it's the difference between having a growth mindset and believing that you work really hard and you can do anything you want within reason and the fixed mindset thinking it's all about talent. I've either got it or I haven't. Now, I started off with a growth mindset, but because of what people were saying to me, and because I didn't really know a lot of stuff, I was very young, I started believing I was talented. And then this thing happened one day. Everybody, you're a great skateboarder, you're brilliant, you should do this, you should do that. And I was like, great. And then there's a competition, and the competition had all the kids from the city, Exeter, up the road, come to the competition. And, uh, and I thought, God, I'm going to do really well here, I'm talented, I, I could do anything I want. And the competition started and we all had three minutes and these guys were like really good, like good, good. I'd, I'd never been on, they, they were brilliant. It was in this car park and I was like, oh. and I went on and I was so worried about looking not good and not maintaining my reputation that I absolutely died. Everything I tried to do, it was like I'd never been on a skateboard. I couldn't stay on the thing. And the, to the clock was ticking and it was just so awful and it, it had a really profound effect on me the wrong effect at the time which i actually got over later but it, it after that i didn't try, i pretty much gave up skateboarding and when i did skateboard i didn't skateboard very well because i had all this stuff in my head and i gave up doing quite a lot of stuff I, I, anything that i would publicly fail at and by publicly i just mean in, in front of a few people i wouldn't do and i, I kind of went into this kind of slump and actually, if you look at the research, this is what happens. If people, if kids especially, believe that they're talented, what they tend to do, if they do something and don't do it very well, they believe they're not talented and they just go, right, that's not my talent, find something else. And they kind of lose this idea of just working at things. And the ego started creeping in and it all became about kind of what, maintaining a kind of image. And it's, it's all completely false, this. It's a complete illusion. And they call it the, oh, what do they call it? The, um, the invisible audience or something like that. This idea that everybody cares what we're doing, you know, and actually people kind of in their own life and then I kind of went I, I remember going to um, a few moments after that where I did kind of let my ego go one was when I went to London I wanted to go to circus school I was a juggler and I wanted to perform as a juggler but I, again this ego thing this idea of failing in front of everybody so I had to kind of keep working and keep working and make sure it's perfect before I and I remember I had to uh, audition for the circus school and the only reason I did it was because I really fancied this girl that was moving to London. And we ended up being together like six years, but I was absolutely beside with her. And so I just went, oh, yeah, I don't care. And just, you know, like an idiot, oh, yeah, I'll audition. Didn't care if I failed or not. And, and actually, because I let that go and it was just all about her, I kind of just did the audition for, well, if it didn't, didn't go, I don't know anybody there. They'll never see me again. And then I started getting this growth mindset. But the point is, the, the, the only, and, and this kept happening, this whole thing. Every time my ego got in the way, an ego just means something that is stopping me doing what I'm doing because I'm worried about what people think. But it's not out there. It's not like if you'd met me, you'd have thought I was just a normal person. I didn't have this massive ego. But I was so caught up in this whole idea that it was stopping me doing certain things. And actually, even now, years later, even though I've done work on this, if I don't do work on it, I can feel it creeping back in. And I, did a, I performed a magic trick today in here. And we are getting onto magic in a minute. I'll talk about the Royal Road. And I was uh, demonstrating with what, one of the people from here, one of the tricks, pretty much a self-working trick from the Royal Road. And I was nervous, right? I was really, oh, what if it doesn't go well? And I just, it's, it's Natalie from next door, you know? She, she doesn't, the amount of times I've tried tricks on them. So, and I realized I have to practice again. Now that I'm gonna be kind of doing magic in front of people again and not on Zoom, because that's my little safety net now. I have to practice now being flawed in front of people, trying new stuff that might not go well. And, and I'm writing a show at the moment. And it makes me realize that now and then how difficult it is sometimes when we think we, we've got it now, we think we're going, we think we're doing the tricks and all that. And actually, if we're not careful, some people like me, I fall back into that safety zone of being risk averse, of not doing anything that, that, that has a, a risk of failure. And actually what I've, realized it is even little things like now so when every time if I haven't done some filming for the course or if I'm just before one of these live things if I get caught up in that perfectionism 
there are times when I don't want to do it. I go, well, I'll try and find excuses not to do it. And I've learned to override that now. And what I've realized is that we've got ego wrong. We, we, we see people that don't seem to have any ego, but they don't do much. And they don't do much sometimes because they're so worried about what people think. So, so people that don't, you, you wouldn't think they were egotistical. You know, if you're, if you're worried about, you know, take performing. So many people don't perform like I didn't for years because they're so worried about not looking great. But the, the big weird irony is if you never perform, you're never going to look anything. You're going to, and I'm not saying you should perform, by the way, but even to friends, this isn't about getting on stage. This is anything. And, and I get so nervous when I'm going to show a trick to friends, I'll kind of start making excuses not to do it. And what I've done over the last few years is to really look into whether I'm not avoiding doing something because of that or whether it's a genuine reason because don't forget we've got to unpick the genuine reasons maybe something is just not worth doing because it's too hard work and it's going we can't do everything so to actually sit down and do the writing and kind of go actually i'm scared of doing this i'm scared of looking flawed but is that stopping me and there's a couple of examples i'll share with you one was when i was contacted by penn and teller after the first season not penn and teller personally um penn and teller fallers and i I filled out a form and I was so worried about looking stupid look because I didn't know what I'd do uh, that at the end of the form it said do you think you can fool Penn and Teller and I said no because <laughs> it's kind of great brilliant so welcome to the show so that was another uh, example of when I, I kind of just stopped myself doing something and I think that the, the key is is to understand and something I've learned at the age of 47 probably only in the last four or five years is that if we, under, if we maintain our flaws and, and are happy to be flawed and not be perfect, actually, and put our ego aside from it and go, okay, I'm going to try this thing and it might not go well, but you know what? That's going to be all right and it's not going to damage me. It's not, it's not brain surgery. Nobody else is going to get hurt. That's when I've kind of moved forward. And Covent Garden, you know, I was five years in Covent Garden, I absolutely died a death. I couldn't hold an audience because the other street performers were there and they were watching me and I was so caught up in, I've got to do it well because they're watching, but I never did it well. It became this awful sort of vicious circle where I try so desperately trying and it, it, it's kind of like dating, you know, if, you, if you're too desperate, it's, it doesn't work and an audience is like that. You've got to have an air of kind of like, let's just see how, that, how this goes. And if I fail, then that's almost fine, you know? And then, and then weirdly enough, this whole paradoxical thing happens where you actually look more confident by not, being like that, if you see what I mean. And it was, I just couldn't get out of this rut. And it was, and I had a nickname, Bailing Steve, because I kept bailing my shows halfway through because I couldn't hold an audience. And I went to Australia. Um, and because I started trying to street perform over there and I didn't really know anybody, and especially in Melbourne, I went to Melbourne and that's the first time I walked out and did my show and it was really good because it, all, it didn't matter because there wasn't all these people that knew me. I wasn't caught up in this kind of pathological, oh no, they've all got to look really good. And don't give me, when I talk about this, it wasn't obvious. You wouldn't have noticed this. And that's why I say it kind of creeps back in. And when I say it changed my life, the times, so this, this um, uh, live show, for, for a long, long time I wanted to do live shows. And what's the big thing that stops people doing things like this is the worry that nobody's going to turn up. Okay? It's like having a party. And for years, I wouldn't have parties in case nobody turned up. It was just an odd thing. This kind of feeling, it, would, it, would, it was a real vulnerable childlike um, uh, feeling and I didn't like it. It made me not feel safe at all. And actually what you realise after time is that if you do something, like the first one of these I did, there's no one here, you know what I mean? And no, just guess what? Nobody died. And, you know, you look at the numbers sometimes, but and the important thing is, is to understand, are you doing, you've got to do it for you. You've got to do it for your own values and something that's important to you. So let's go back to the Royal Road and why I'm holding the Royal Road book up. This last couple of weeks, there's a couple of things I, I want to do in my show. One of them is to juggle five balls. Now I've been five ball juggler for years, but I'm no good at it. And I've never admitted that to myself. Um, the other is, a, there's this trick with it where you catch a ball on your head. Again, I've been doing it in my show for years, but not very well. And for the first time I admitted this last couple of weeks, so I, so I went back to basics. I'm getting a really strong five ball pattern now because I'm, I'm juggling one ball. I'm in my lounge at home, juggling one ball for half an hour at a time. I've been juggling for 30 odd years and I'm there back with one ball, you know, and, and last night, funnily enough, I was doing it and I had the curtains drawn. I'm thinking, oh, what if people see me juggling? And I'm like, it doesn't matter. And then I was looking at the Royal Road today 
and I'm reading this book and I'm going, I don't know these tricks. I, d I didn't know. <laughs> and I've talked to, I've read this book years ago. I can't remember any of it. I'm going through it and I'm going, and, and it, I realized that the reason I've talked about the Royal Roll and talked about it with, with great sort of, you know, um, confidence is because I used to know it. I don't know it. And I couldn't admit to myself that I didn't know it. If you'd have questioned me on what's, you know, what's in this chapter, I haven't got a clue. I remember them. They're sort of coming back to me now. But I'm doing these tricks. I'm doing the trick with Natalie earlier. And it's a trick that as magicians, we would say, if we were experienced, we would go, oh, I wouldn't do a trick like that. It's a self-worker. It's got free piles and they do the thing. Natalie next door has seen a lot. She, I've seen, I've done like stuff that floors everybody and they're just like, you know, wiki test, things like that. They've seen it all next door because I try it out on them, I, you know, and they, I, they never know how it's done. Never, never good. I did this self work here, dealing cards out and all the stuff and it totally floored her. It was wonderful. She, I, I named the card, I turned the card over and she just went, <gasps> like that and she said, that's amazing. And the only thing that stopped me doing, and I don't mean, that sort of trick doesn't fit in a lot of things, but the ego gets so caught up and, and we've got to understand that it gets fed by other people as well. We kind of start playing this game where we kind of reinforce each other's ego and we start going, yeah, you don't want to do that. Or that's when we take the mickey out of people that are maybe doing the things maybe we secretly want to do, um, but it makes us feel insecure. So we take the, take the mickey out of them. And, and you get this a lot with people that have achieved success on Britain's Got Talent, America's Got Talent. You hear the people, you, you hear the rumblings of it in the, in the forums where you see this kind you hear this this kind of backstabbing stuff going on and people finding flaw in everything everything people people do and I suppose the fear is to be on the other end of that and actually what you realize after a while after a while is that that's okay you can't please everybody and that's what I mean by kind of letting the ego go it's kind of go you know my show in September I'm putting all this stuff into it. It's a huge risk and it may not be very good, but I've got to be, I've got to be okay with that. It doesn't mean I don't do my best, but the reason I haven't done a live show, a new one, a new not safe, as in not doing my usual routines that I know kill because I had support when I was making them of people like Peter Wardell, who would arguably, you know, most of that routine is his, the one that I do. I've got one if going to take that risk and I've, as long as I'm putting stuff into it that means a lot to me that isn't just I want to impress people it's something that comes from somewhere deeper then I can't lose you can't lose and what I would say if you're working on stuff and if you're nervous about performing that first time you perform a trick accept that it probably isn't gonna it doesn't mean it, it will go well as in they, they'll not know how it's done they'll think it's great and probably but if it doesn't that's okay too because that's part of the process of learning how to kind of get rid of that ego and magic became a real, real, real joy for me when it stopped being about me and started being more for the experience of that other person. And it's kind of like, I think it says at the end of the movie, The Prestige, you know, we forget why we're doing it. It's the look on their faces, but it's not even a look on their faces because, because you could read that as hey, they think I'm awesome. Because what you realize is that's, that doesn't last. That thing when you first get into magic, where you have that and it is very intoxicating. You know, you do it, your first few gigs that go well, you have people, sometimes of, you know, people that you may find rather attractive, whatever that is the same gender or a different gender or whatever, saying to you, you're amazing, you're amazing. And that is really like, but after a while you realize that that doesn't really stick. It doesn't mean anything. It's nice, don't get me wrong, and you're appreciative of it, but it's, it's not enough. And actually what will drive you forward is understanding that you're providing or sharing an experience with someone and, and enriching their lives in, in a small way that they will never forget. And that's where it becomes, and not because they think you're great, you know, it's because something else. At the same time, one caveat, there's nothing wrong with a bit of ego. There's nothing wrong with thriving off that a little bit and having that lovely feeling that people think what you do is cool. That's, fine. that's not what I'm talking about. We're not egoless, we're human beings. But it's how much that either stops you doing something or drives what you're doing because that is it, there's a shallowness to that and a lack of um, consistency. To it. it won't keep you going forever. So I thought I'd share that because I'm and I want to read something to you. It's like a little story time. And this is this, like I said, this weird thing where we actually understand that the people out there doing it that are plastering themselves all over YouTube like me. That, that I kind of managed to do this because I let the, it's not ego going, hey, loads of people are going to watch me. It's kind of going, I'm going to take a risk today and I might not look that good. This is live. I'm just, you could be looking at it going, God, this is awful. Um, but I've got to accept that. 
And these aren't rehearsed, right? So I know that it's, you know, we've got to be flawed. So this is from uh, Daring Greatly. And this is, it's a famous speech. Um, Theodore uh, Roosevelt. Roosevelt. Is it Roosevelt? Roosevelt, anyway. Um, uh, it, uh, here we go. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. Sound familiar? The credit belongs to the man who is, and of course, gender specific, but we, we, we're talking about everyone. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error or shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? Who knows great enthusiasms and great devotions? Who spends himself in a worthy cause? Who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement? And who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while, dare, while daring greatly? And, and I think of those, you know, those failures. Who, we just can't do what we want to do without getting over the fact that we're going to come unstuck sometimes. And you can't be scared of it. You, we, we have to kind of move forward. And your magic will become so much more enjoyable. It never goes, all right? It never becomes easy for me to do a new trick with someone. I've accepted that. But the difference is now I do it, and I might put it off for quite a while, but I do it because of, of, of I know it's what it's going to give me in the end. And it's, um, and it's lovely. And, and once we get to that place, I think this is such a lovely, enriching um, thing to do. And it might be magic, it could be comedy, anyway, but, uh, but I thought I'd share that with you. And you can now tell me if I'm talking absolute nonsense, don't make any sense. Um, Magic Adam. My real name is Adam Baxter. My ego is Magic Adam. I sell both. <laughs> Great. Um, cool. Cheers from Canada from the Magic Buzz. Uh, nice to see you. So do ask, ask any questions now or do comment if, if it kind of made any sense that. Uh, it's not like a, you know, like I say, it's not like a written concise piece, of course. Uh, but and then I'll, I'll, I'll go in a minute because I don't want to keep you too long. And if you want to know what the book is, it's a really good book. Um, Brené Brown, Daring Greatly. Watch Brené Brown's um, TED Talk about vulnerability. And that's what we're talking about, isn't it? We're talking about just being, uh, being vulnerable and being okay with that. Not something you see in magic that, that much. Uh, right. So um, I'm going to go. Thank you very much, everyone. Last chance for any questions uh, or comments. Um, but do please... Uh, like and subscribe, do all that good stuff. Check out carmagiccourse.com. That'd be great. And uh, and if you like this sort of stuff, do tell people. You know, do do feel. You know, every time someone mentions it, and I get one new subscriber, it's great. So um, thanks very much. There's nothing popping up. Um, so let me just check whether it's there. No, I think we're good. Um, so have a good one. Take care. See you later. Bye.